Thank you all very much for, for being here. Um, the Holocaust has, has been with me for a very long time now. And in my experience, it affects people. Um, it affects people in a way that is different from the way that any other historical event affects us. The historical record is full of human suffering. And when we look upon this human suffering, we are saddened by it. But when we look upon the Holocaust, we are frightened. The Holocaust frightens us. Why is that? What is different? What is special? What is unique about the Holocaust? This evening, I want to offer you an answer to this question. I'll start by uh, stating how I came to write this book and why I think this book may be useful for you. I then want to briefly summarize uh, the central argument of my book, which is my explanation of, of why the Holocaust happened. And then I want to circle back for the remainder of my remarks uh, to the question of what makes the Holocaust unique. My engagement with the Holocaust began when I was 14 years old. I read a book called The Murderers Among Us by Simon Wiesenthal. And although I could not articulate it at the time, I, I immediately recognized that the Holocaust confronts us with fundamental questions about what it means to be a human being. And this insight left me with an urgent need to understand how something like this could have been possible. It really was at this point that I asked myself the question that is the title of my book. How could this happen? How could something like this have been possible? And this, this need has shaped a very large part of the course of my life ever since. Um, to be sure, there was never a moment when I frightened my parents by coming down to the breakfast table and proudly announcing that when I grow up I want to be a Holocaust historian. Um, but it is a large part of why I took up the study of the German language in high school, uh, why I majored in history and German studies as an undergraduate at Stanford, why I went on to earn my PhD at, uh, in German history at Columbia University under the direction of Fritz Stern, why I became a history professor and taught German history at the college level for a number of years. And throughout all this period, across almost four decades now, I read, I, look, I searched constantly for a book that would answer for me the basic question, why? And I never found anything that came even close. The closest that I could get is the many narrative histories of the Holocaust, many of which some of you will have, will have read. Um, but the unfortunate thing about these books is that all they talk about is the immediate short-term causes of the Holocaust. That is to say, what did Adolf Hitler believe about the Jews, and what were the situational pressures that pushed German Nazi, Nazi German policy toward the Jews in a more radical direction from discrimination in 1933 to expulsion effectively in 1938 to full-blown genocide by the end of 1941. And these, these short-term causes are an essential part of the story, but they're inadequate by themselves because they only beg uh, many, many other questions. For example, where did Hitler get his ideas about the Jews in the first place? And even more interesting, how can we explain that the educated elite of one of our most advanced societies could take such ideas seriously? And what went wrong in the long-term political development of Germany that a man like Adolf Hitler could come to power, whereas in our country or in France or England, some other Western democracy, he would have had no chance at all? And what are we to make of the attitude of tens of millions of Germans who did have substantial knowledge of the killing while it was happening, and yet who seemed to have been coldly indifferent to the fate of the Jewish people. How do we answer these questions? And there are many other questions that one has to answer in order to, to assemble a workable answer to the larger question of why did this happen? The interesting thing is that historians have, uh, over time, provided persuasive answers to each of these different sub-questions that make up the larger question of why did the Holocaust happen? But they have done so largely in specialized academic studies, each addressing this or that cause of the Holocaust, pardon me, um, largely in is isolation from each other. So as you will have encountered, there, there are plenty of books on Hitler, and there are books on World War I. There are books on anti-Semitism. There are books on racism. There are books on psychological factors that played a role. But there's been no book that puts all of these different pieces of the puzzle together in a coherent explanation of the event. There have been thousands 
and thousands and thousands of books written upon about the Holocaust. And now here tonight you have before you yet another. And you have to be asking yourselves, what can possibly be new here? It's a very reasonable question. And my answer to that question is that this is the first book that pulls together all or nearly all the major sort of strands of explanation, all the major pieces of the puzzle uh, in a coherent and reasonably comprehensive answer to the question, why did the Holocaust happen? That is what is new about this book. That is what I hope will be useful about this book for you. So that said, why did the Holocaust happen? Um, in very brief summary, it happened for more than any other reason because the German people from the 1880s on were, uh, ex uh, were exceptionally divided against each other, uh, divided along the lines of social class, uh, divided by religion, Catholic versus Protestant, uh, divided by the antagonisms between the major political parties, of which the most important was the antagonism between the Socialist Party and the rest of German society and the rest of the political system. The German Socialist Party was the largest and most dogmatically Marxist uh, Socialist Party in Europe. Uh, by the eve of World War I, it had become the largest political party in Germany. It was also the largest Socialist Party in Europe. Uh, and to the imperial government and to Germany's ruling class, the socialists were a terrifying threat. They posed the threat of a violent social and economic revolution. And their principal strategy, the strategy of Germany's ruling class and of the imperial government for a strategy for managing the divisions that were tearing apart German society and for containing this growing threat from the socialist party was to try to unite Germans against enemies. Um, and very prominent among these enemies were the Jewish people. And the um, central to this approach, to this strategy of, of uniting Germans against enemies, against foreign countries abroad, against Jews at home, was the accusation that the Jewish people were the instigators of Marxism, that without Jews there would be no socialist party, just as this fantasy continued into the 1920s and 1930s, the belief that without Jews there would be nowhere in Europe or anywhere in the world a communist threat. So this is, we're talking about a strategy of essentially political self-defense by the ruling class of imperial Germany against the socialist threat, trying to paper over the divisions in German society and trying to, uh, in particular, contain the threat of socialism by using anti-Semitism as its principal political weapon, as, a, as the enemy against which the German people could be united. And this strategy had a number of consequences that led to the Holocaust. One, this is almost certainly where Adolf Hitler got his ideas about the Jewish people. Uh, it is also something that uh, <clears throat> this political socialization to anti-Semitism and the equation of anti-Semitism with communism is, goes a very long way to explaining why the elite of German society, and in particular the higher civil service and the military, happily uh, participated in the Holocaust once Hitler gave the orders in 1941. Uh, the Holocaust also happened um, because in that day and age, racism was not, uh, as it is seen today, seen as uh, the prejudice of the uneducated. It was seen as scientific fact, uh, the notion that there were inborn genetic differences between, uh, in, inborn, very important inborn differences between the different nationalities of the world and differences in their value and in their moral qualities was seen as absolute scientific fact. This made it possible to define the Jews as a kind of separate subhuman species that was inherently destructive, uh, and thereby to rob them of their humanity. Um, this combined with another factor uh, that made possible the enormous uh, violence committed by the Third Reich, and that was that in the First World War, 10 million young men lost their lives uh, in pointless combat, and this cheapened human life in the minds of very many who had lived through that experience, it lowered the bar for violence in Europe. It made unprecedented levels of violence conceivable and then acceptable um, to, to many of the people in the German government. That combined with the legitimacy, the respectability of racism at that time, helps us to understand how the perpetrators of the Holocaust could come to completely deny the humanity of their victims. And this complete radical dehumanization of the Jewish victims of the Holocaust 
I will argue is one of the signature features of the event and one of the things that makes it unique. The Holocaust had several other causes as well. By my count, it had actually about a dozen, and they came together in ways that were enormously complex. And one of my biggest challenges, really, in writing this book was to, to find a way to master this complexity um, and to somehow find uh, an order and a way in which to present all these different factors and in their, their interactions so that at the end of the book, all the pieces of the puzzle fall into place in a way that makes this exceptionally complex historical event, in fact, relatively straightforward to understand, which ultimately it is, if looked at from the right perspective. 